Mike's on. All right, a little after 2 o'clock. Before you know it, an hour from now, Joe and Amos will join us. So we have that coming up. Looking forward to that. Let's get some calls in. Rich and Clifton, what's up, Rich? Hey, Mike, how are you? Good, what's uh, happening? At uh, Hackensack Medical event and shared with you that I had lost my brother to natural causes and our thoughts and prayers were always with you and your family as yours with, with uh, ours, and you were very gracious to me that day. Okay, thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, hey, also, I have the same last name as the Brooklyn Dodgers catcher, so uh, I, was, I met Yogi one day and uh, you know mentioned that to him, and I went to school with a guy named Jim Pearsall, so we had Campy and Pearsall in the same class. But Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, I always loved Terry Bradshaw and the Bradshaw Bullet, and, uh, you know, and, and Joe Montana watched you know, all of those games. I always liked Terry better. In, in my mind, I would have had Terry in my camp and always wanted to know what you thought about that. Uh, Terry, you know, was a very underrated quarterback on a lot of levels. The first two Steeler championships were won with defense. The last two were won with the Bradshaw passing game. Uh, Big thrower, made big plays, was not the play-in, play-out quarterback of some of the other guys, but still is clearly a Hall of Famer and and a very talented quarterback, no question. David in Brooklyn, what's up, David? Hey, Mike, how are you? Good. Mike, I know you've been getting stories from people, so I'll just add mine to the mix. I grew up listening to you with my father on the radio, and now I listen to you with my son. You're spanning three generations in my family. You've been an institution, and I really appreciate everything you've done. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to ask you quickly. I haven't gotten through to you since the Cashman interview. If you recall, Cashman mentioned that he wouldn't commit to giving Gleyber Torres the job. He said he'd have to... um, uh, compete for it. I'm wondering if you think now that they have Stanton, would there be any chance that they would trade Torres for an ace? No, I think that Tan- I think now Stanton, uh, God, but Torres stays. Uh, he will be the one of the few guys they will really be reluctant to trade. I think they think he will make- win the second base job. Uh, so I think there'll be very few guys uh, that they will be absolutely against trading. But I think Torres will be one of them. I think they will try very hard to keep Torres in this deal. I think the other guys could go. I think Frazier could go. I think there's a lot of guys that could go. Uh, but I think he's the one guy that won't go anywhere. Chris in Belleville, what's up, Chris? <clears throat> hey, Mike, what's up? What's happening? Hey, I don't think you're going you're gonna to disappear like Carson, so I'm not going to give you too much of a, a swan song gotcha. yet. Hopefully gotcha. we'll find you sooner than later. Gotcha. Uh, about the fit, you're showing the fan, though. You know, Not that it's ever ho- easy to get through to you, but I've noticed that whenever there was a, a world event going on, non-sporting event, you know, whether it was the election or a death of somebody or, you know, God forbid, an attack somewhere, your show was always the hardest to get through to during those times. And I think that's an testament that people were just as excited to talk to you about world events, not just sports. So, I appreciate it. Thank you. A question I had about um, Stan. When you talked to him and during his press conference, I think he said all the right things about he didn't mind where he played in terms of left, left field or right field. But when a big star like that is making a contract and, and agreeing to come to a team, especially one with the no-trade clause, don't you think that's something that's already established where he's going to say, listen, I'll go to the Yankees, but I'm playing right field? Not unless he really made it a point, and he might not care. You know, maybe let's give him the benefit of the doubt that he doesn't care. Uh, now, he's got to prove that, and you, and you might be right, and he might put a real fuss up down the road, and maybe he just wanted to sound good. Because i got to tell you, Stanton sounded good. He sounded good in his press conference. He sounded good with me. He gave you all the right answers. He 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 played the team guy right down the line. Yep. He, he oh. said he said the right things. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. Now I don't see, I don't see Judge and Stanton playing that big left field at Yankee Stadium. And, and to me, one of them's got to play there. And when you talk to Cashman, I thought it was silly that. He kind of alluded to, well, they'll play a little bit of left, they'll play a little bit of right, maybe they'll play center. I, I think they know what's going to First of all, they're not playing center. Yeah. You know, Hicks is playing center, so you know that. And maybe if Gaudy were here, he could play in a pinch in center. But I, I, first of all, I don't think Gaudy's going to be here. I really don't. Because I think one of these guys has got to play left field. And I think that's going to be the question. He, all, he said, well, you know, we could put him in a small left field around the league. We wouldn't put him in Yankee Stadium. Well, you got half your games in Yankee Stadium. Yeah. And Yankee Stadium, their left field is cavernous right. compared to playing right field. So I don't know about one of those big guys playing left field. Um, and I think you're right. I think it's going to be judged because he's younger and because uh, he's probably the better outfielder that looks to play left. But that's going to be a hard field to play. They will miss They will miss the gloves out there, and they wanted to improve their outfield defense a couple of years ago, and they did. We'll have to wait and see what happens here with that. Uh, Ken in Babylon. What's up, Ken? 
Hey, Mike, how you doing? Good, what's up? I uh, just wanted to thank you again for all the years, like everyone else. Thank really you. Really appreciate listening to you over the years. Thank you. Uh, I got a quick question about the Jets. You know, this past weekend was a really brutal wake-up call for them, I think, and a wake-up call for the ownership as well With in regards to um, Todd Bowles. I want to throw some stats at you real quick. Yeah. Over the Bowles' three seasons, three past seasons, he's 9-14 and 14 away from home. And two of those away games, one was in London and one was at the Giants, so in MetLife. And two again, two of those wins were against the Browns. What do you think about Bulls' future in New York uh, with the way he's getting his team prepared late in the season? I think McCagden is a given. I think McCagden makes to make the call. I think McCagden's going to be here a long time. I think he's got to make the call on Bulls, and I would trust him to make it. I think Bulls right now is not a given but I think he gets another chance. I wouldn't be giving Bowles a five-year deal, but I think he will get a modest extension and get another chance to coach the team, and I think he deserves that. Like I said, I don't think he's a given, but I'm not ready to part, part ways with him either. I've seen improvements from this team this year. That's the first game they didn't really show up at this year. I think they've played hard almost every week. I think for the most part they've had a decent plan. They've made a lot of mistakes, but you know what? Three of those games, the quarterback made the mistakes, and the quarterback was good for them all year. But he made a terrible interception before the half against the Patriots, which really killed that game. Number two, he made a terrible pass that made no sense against the Dolphins, cost him that game. And then he made a fumble against the Carolina, which cost him that game. They could have won two of those three games without even really working up a sweat. Andy in Seattle, what's up, Andy? Hey, Mike, how are you? Good. Um yeah, part of the reason why uh, you're such a good listen is your ability to kind of bob and weave in the national picture and the local picture. I know college football in the Northeast isn't a big topic, especially with hot stove going on if the local teams are doing well. But uh, this time of the year with bowl season cranking up, sure. you know, it's funny. Some of my friends out here in Seattle are like, oh, there's too many bowl games this year. And I know they, it basically doubled in the last 20 years. I'm like, what do you mean there's too many bowl games? We're all blazing on them. We're all gambling on them. And hey, the bowl like the- games is, is – here's what you say to the people about that. Don't watch them. You know what? The bowl games are there when you want them. If you don't want them all, you know, you don't want the early bowls because you don't like those teams. Some people don't get to follow those teams. If you don't want those teams, fine. If you got the people who want to see, you know, South Florida or want to see some of the, WAC, the, the MAC teams, well, then you know what? They'll watch those bowls. There's enough bowl games for everybody. I love the bowl games. I, I always, I, what I like about the bowl games is, they're extreme matchups for the most part, and there's a lot of elements into analyzing bowl games that never come into play in the regular season. Uh, like, is the staff whole and content, or is it a staff that's in complete flux, where the coordinator is going to coach the game, but he's going here. The coach already went here. This guy's unhappy that he didn't get the job. He's here. And then you realize that team didn't try to prepare their team for the bowl game. So you got to take a lot of things into account in a bowl game that you don't in a regular season, which to me makes the bowl games a lot more fun to analyze. Yeah, fun to analyze, handicap, like yes. motivation's a factor. Like Nick, you know, motivation's Saban, always when he's a factor. Not in the BCS bowl, or when they they're not in the playoffs. Like remember, they lost to Alabama uh, Utah. in an Alabama in any game that isn't for a championship is a disaster in the bowl games. Absolutely yeah, I mean, a disaster. To, they lost, they lost to Utah, to Utah and uh, yep. Oklahoma. Uh, yep, that, and they've mailed it in in those games. Alabama, when they don't have a reason to play, many times you can see where the, the team just doesn't. I mean, I can think of games where I can remember 15, 20-point upsets where teams didn't just didn't want to play the game. Plus, also, get a guy who's passed over for the job, but he's going to quarterback. He's going to be the coordinator this week, and he'll be the, he's going to head coach the game. He's been the coordinator all year, but he didn't get the job. He got passed over, and then he's leaving for somewhere else. Good luck with him running that game that night. Okay, that's the stuff you got to watch. Kevin in Oceanport, what's up, Kevin? Hey, how's it going, Mike? What's happening? Uh, I just wanted to call you one last time. Thank you for all the years. Well, thank uh, you. I'm not sure if you remember me, but I was actually... Oh, I could, I, I could never forget you, as a matter of fact. At, at, at the SummerSlam with the, um, the fat head of you at the wrestling a couple oh, years ago. Oh, absolutely. You're the guy at the wrestling that uh, put up that big picture of me. I remember yeah. it well. Absolutely. Yeah. You were and, the guy with Mons. You, know, matter they you, got, they you, got, you uh, hung out with Mons, didn't you? At the garden. In yes. a couple of weeks, are you going with your son? Uh, I, w- I wouldn't miss it. Uh, I, w- I wouldn't miss. It. Matter of fact, we might. Uh, Mons and, uh, and and Chris might actually have a tag team that night. Really? Yeah, that's what I heard. Wow. <laughs> 
Well, thanks, Mike. I we appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and thank you. And enjoy the wrestling when it comes your way. That's one of Monza's guys, okay, the wrestling guys. Uh, you know, I don't know where you find the Monza with the wrestling guys. I Alex, look like Taz now. I can move like that's him. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Alex in Bernardsville. What's up, Alex? Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me. I got a question for you. With 30 years of perspective now, where do you see, like, the, uh, the change in sports salaries? And player power, and the player, like the uh, the idea of them being businessmen now. Um, well, remember remember as this: to strictly athletes. Look at sports properly now. Sports. This is how you look at a professional league: the owners and the players are partners. Fifty percent of the revenue goes to the owners. Fifty percent of the revenue goes to the players. It's divided up, say, in leagues that have salary caps for them that way, but it's based on that. T always figure now, you're talking about, for the most part, a 50-50 revenue split between the league. The owners are going to get 50%. Now, the owners pull a couple of tricky things, like they take a million, a billion off the top for administrative before they, they start the ticker on the 50%. But for the most part, you're looking at 50% going to the players and salary, 50% going to the owners. That's the way it works. Uh, in most leagues now, it, it, the players are going to make that kind of money. The biggest problem I see, I see two problems for sports going forward long term. One, that they continue to make the in-game attendance at the stadium something that people make the trip for. That with TV getting better and the technology being better at home, and you don't have to travel. The idea of going to the game has got to stimulate you. There's got to be a reason to go to the game. They have got to make the game important enough for you to go to and exciting enough for you to go to. That's number one. So how, whether you're not, you fill the stadium versus stay home and do and watch it on all this, you know, brilliant technology you have at home is a big key. Number two, and this is one that's a little longer range, but I think it's a real problem. Esports is going to eventually become a threat to professional sports. When you can draw without any trouble 25 million people to watch an esports championship, have 25 million people without any, any promotion, without anything, and have that kind of attendance where people are at their homes or watching around the world, 25 million deep. That thing's scary in the future. And if you notice, Kraft and Cuban and a bunch of different people have bought into those esports franchises. They're going to be big someday. And the question is, when does that, in a world that's going to become more and more about virtual reality, and virtual reality is going to be enormous, and artificial intelligence and virtual reality are going to dominate every walk of life in the years to come. Esports could have an enormous commanding position in that kind of world. Here's the Mink Man.